Welcome to the first university lecture of our 2009 and 10 academic year. I want to especially thank the uh, trustees, the administrators, the faculty members, and the students who are here with us this evening. And I want to extend a special welcome to Dr. Dorothy Steele, the wife of our featured speaker today. Dorothy is one of the nation's experts on early childhood education. Before coming to New York, she served as the executive director of the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity at Stanford University. And on behalf of Jean, my wife, and me, we want to extend our personal welcome to you, Dorothy, and to Claude. This lecture series is part of a Columbia tradition dating back to 1971, when the Columbia professor and literary critic Lionel Trilling delivered the first university lecture. I have come to realize at Columbia that if you want to start a tradition, ask Lionel Trilling to be the first participant. Since then, at least twice a year, the university affords a distinguished member of the faculty the opportunity to share with us the insights the person has gained from the particular course of study. Today, we are especially delighted to welcome to the stage our new university provost and professor of psychology, Claude Steele. As most of you know, Claude has succeeded Alan Brinkley as Columbia's 21st provost. And for the past few weeks, he has been working hard to get to know us and the larger Columbia community. He has met with a number of deans, administrators, faculty and students, and he and Dorothy and their golden retriever, Theo, are settling in to a life in New York after many years as part of the Stanford University community. Claude and Dorothy had some major decisions to make as they considered whether or not to move to New York. One of the weightiest involved a potential sibling rivalry, rivalry between their daughter, Jory, who lives in San Francisco, and their son, Benjamin, who lives here in New York. They were faced with a tug of war between leaving Jory, their son-in-law, and their four-month-old grandchild, Matthew, in California, and having the chance to move closer to Benjamin, their daughter-in-law, and their 10-month-old grandchild, Coleman, who live in Brooklyn. Lucky for us, Benjamin won. And we must, however, expect Claude and Dorothy to make regular trips back to California to spend time with their daughter, Jory, and little Matthew. And if we know anything about psychology, we know they've already concluded that all things considered, the decision to move here was for the best. At Stanford, Claude served most recently as the Lucy Stern Professor in Social Sciences, Director of the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, and Director of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. In addition to his impeccable record as a teacher and administrator, Claude is a recognized leader in the field of social psychology. His research focuses on the psychological experience of the individual and particularly on the experience of threats to the self and the consequences of those threats. His early work considered the self-image threat, self-affirmation and its role in self-regulation, and the role of alcohol and drug abuse in self-regulation processes and social behavior. While my colleague actually, Claude was, at the University of Michigan in the late 1980s, he began to turn his attention to the puzzle of why very capable minority students were doing less well academically than their levels of accomplishment at entry would predict. This led him to develop the theory of stereotype threat, the phenomenon whereby the threat 
of confirming a stereotype about one's group disrupts one's performance in an activity. The theory has proved very useful in understanding group differences in performance ranging from the intellectual to the athletic. Provost Steele is widely recognized and is re the recipient of numerous fellowships and awards, including the Dean's Award from Stanford, the Teaching Award, and the American Psychological Association's Award for Distinguished Contributions to Psychology in the Public Interest. He has also taught at the University of Utah and, as I mentioned, the University of Michigan and the University of Washington. Claude is a friend and a colleague to many of us in the Columbia community. His work has had a profound impact not only on academic scholarship, but also it has influenced academic and public policy. This is something I know firsthand, as his research was instrumental, and we drew on it a lot, in the Grutter decision of 2003, when the Supreme Court upheld affirmative action in admissions policies in universities across the country. Our own professor of psychology, Geraldine Downey, credits Claude's research for guiding many of the strategies the university has employed in increasing diversity among our faculty in recent years. Claude's lecture this evening is based on his upcoming book, Whistling Vivaldi, and other clues to how stereotypes affect us. Through the use of dramatic life stories, Claude shares the experiments and studies that repeatedly show the negative impact stereotypes can have on academic performance. And he shows how both the targets and the perpetrators of such, such stereotypes, how to break this cycle. It is very clear that while our new provost has much to learn from us, we too have much to learn from him. In thinking about how to introduce and welcome Claude to the Columbia community, it seemed after all was said and done, the best way was a radical one of simply sitting and listening to him talk about his ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to present Columbia University Provost and today's lecturer, Claude Steele. Thank you, Lee, for those uh, words. They're, they're kind and generous and um, uh, much appreciated. Uh, I, I couldn't have a, a better introduction to the Columbia community than, than that set of remarks, and so um, uh, I, I much appreciate it. Uh, I'll, I'll also just take this opportunity to say how happy we are to be here at Columbia. <laughs> uh, one thing we're happy to have over is the move. You know, moves are pretty traumatic, the, the, the upheaval involved, and so we're, we're really happy to be uh, uh, settling in at this point. Uh, but we also find Columbia just to be an exciting and interesting university and uh, a, a place with a, a great deal of, of potential. And I know every day is a kind of Maybe I'm having the thrill of an anthropologist, you know, learning about a new place, but, but it's been an awful lot of fun, and so I want to uh, express some, some appreciation there. Um, my mission tonight is, is really to describe uh, my research activities over the last 20 years in about 35 minutes by my, <laughs> by my count. So uh, I'll do the best I can in, in that respect, but you should never trust an academic. You know, they're always <laughs> a little pushing the time. So give me a signal if it goes on too, uh, too long. Um, this, is, this is work which I think uh, can be roughly summarized with, with the, the, the term stereotype threat and a social identity threat, which is a broader version of, of, of that. Uh, I, I'm a social psychologist, an experimental social psychologist, and, and one of the, uh, the, the thrills of being a social psychologist is that it, it's that science which is pitched at every day, tries to understand every day social life and experience. Uh, it's not focused on the galaxy, it's not focused on molecular structures, it's focused on 
the, the level of analysis is everyday uh, experience. You get to sort of peer back from the surface of things and you look in and you see what you find and oftentimes you find things that are very counterintuitive about what goes on in everyday life. And I hope you'll get a little bit of that sensation as, as uh, uh, I described the course of this re research. That's one way of thinking about how it, f it felt to us. Uh, the, the part of everyday life that got us started were really two problems, two real world problems as Lee uh, alluded to. Uh, the first is the underperformance in school and on tests of groups in society whose, whose intellectual abilities are negatively stereotyped. Uh, a lot of this work, as you'll see, has focused on the experience of women in quantitative math and quantitatively based fields, the sciences, engineering, and, and, and the like. Uh, and an awful lot of it is also focused on the experience of minority students pretty much across the academic board. Uh, this is, a, as I say, a 20-year-old research uh, uh, topic at this point, so there are now studies looking at everything from academic performance to athletic performance. I'm going to stick today on the, on the academic uh, theme. So that's one problem that got us started. The other problem might be called the, uh, the diversity problem, for lack of, of a better term. Uh, and the idea here is that, um, you know, it's one thing to numerically integrate a setting, a classroom, a school, a workplace. It's one thing to numerically integrate that setting. It's a very different thing to make that setting a place where everybody, regardless of their identity, feels like they can flourish in the situation and that they can unselfconsciously engage the, the, the task, the manifest task of the situation. How do you make a situation work like that, work for everybody? Uh, that's the, the second sort of practical problem that, that launches, that has launched this, this work. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot in this talk about um, the academic focus of, of this research, but I hope that you'll get, at least as a back theme, uh, some idea about how these processes work in, in your own lives. I, I, I do think that everybody experiences stereotype threat at least a couple of times a day. <laughs> and uh, I hope by the end of the talk you have a sense of when you're experiencing it and when you're not and what it's about and what the reactions to it might be. Uh, so I have both a focus and a larger um, uh, ambition for what, what you get out of this. Um, the organization will be a little bit of theory, a little bit of evidence, and then a little bit of remedy, what to do about this, this problem. So uh, it will sound maybe a little analytical and a little, uh, boy, he's perseverating on, on the difficulties, but at the end I'm working towards some framework for remedy and solution. And I think over the last six years that's where the most exciting research in this area uh, has been focused. Um, Okay, I'll begin with the, the, a very simple concept. I wish I could see that better than I could read it, but, but the, the, the idea of social identity. I put this as a standard textbook definition of, of social identity. It's the part of personal identity, one sense of one's, of oneself, that comes from group memberships in the social categories to which we belong, and I really put that up so that you'll see the long list of social identities that we, we have age, sex, race, religion, profession, ethnicity, nationality, sexual orientation, political affiliation, mental health status. These are all uh, social identities uh, that, that they all meet that definition. And one way of thinking about the, the thrust of this research is what is it that makes a given social identity very important to us and important in how we function? And we have a very simple answer to that question. Maybe, maybe it's too simple, but we're pushing it right now. Uh, the answer is, uh, if the things you have to deal with in particular situations because you have the identity. If you have to deal with things in situations because you have the identity, then that identity is likely to become very important to you. That's the argument. If you do not have to deal with things that are uh, of great importance to you based on having an identity, then that identity is, is, is not really central to your functioning. It may be something that you know about, it may be something you have a historical interest in, there are ways of, of relating to it, but it won't be central to how you function on a daily basis. That's the, the strong argument. The thing that, the term that we use to, to refer to this, the, this, the things you have to deal with because you have an identity are identity contingencies contingencies of identity. That's what that, that's what that term is designed to, to refer to. I'll give you an example. I have been writing this book and it does have a bit of a memoir structure to it and at one point I remember asking myself, uh, what is the, the, the what, what moment did I, did I realize I was black? 
When did that strike me? Uh, and to the best of my memory, which no good psychologist trusts entirely, <laughs> but to the best of my memory, uh, I think it happened when I was in the second or third grade and it was like the last day of school and we were on our way home from school and somebody started talking about the fact that we couldn't go to the swimming pool that was about three blocks away uh, except on Wednesday afternoons. And I, I, just, and I just couldn't believe that. And the, the idea was that we couldn't go to the swimming pool uh, except on Wednesday, Wednesday afternoons because we were black. And there was this kind of discourse about this and people are trying to figure it out and we're, we're all upset about it and what could this mean? And you know, a, an eight-year-old's mind is <laughs> uh, uh, struggling with this, with this question. And, and, you know, questions that you, you're never going to get an answer to. What, why is this important to everybody that we can't go swimming? Everybody else can go swimming all the time and we can't go swimming? It's a question. Uh, and the most important feature of the question, I think, for the, purpose, for the purposes I'm using it here, is, to, is that it's the question that makes you aware you've got an identity, that you are black, that it has some particular meaning in this situation. You don't know what it is. You don't know why it is. You don't know when it's going to be relevant to you, when it's not going to be relevant to you. But this is like a scary fact because it means that at some point it could be relevant to you. You can't put it down. You'd like to put it down, but you can't put it down. So it becomes something that moves inside and you start to think about it and you elaborate it and you relate to other people on the basis of who has the identity and who doesn't have the, the identity and it starts to become something that structures your experience of, of, of the world. And I'm arguing that without that kind of thing, uh, an identity just doesn't do all that. It doesn't move in and doesn't do all that, that, that work for us. Um, if, if, you know, if you were in a society where everybody was black, for example, let's say I was in Lagos, Nigeria, um, uh, the, 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 that particular identity might not be very psychologically significant for me. Not in the same way it is in this context. It's, it's a contextual thing. So you can see the implications here. Uh, I, I'd love to go on talking about this, but I got so much to cover, I'm going to have to race over things. Uh, but I suppose the main point I'm trying to, to make with this illustration uh, is that identity is very situational. Uh, the identities that mean a lot to us in this particular situation may not mean that much to us in another situation. I go to Europe, I experience race in a very different way than I, ex I experience it here. Um, and it, it has to do with how the society is organized around that identity, the things that you have to deal with because you have the identity. The other point I want to make is that, I don't have to get my pointer here, uh, some contingencies are more important than other contingencies. Where, there we go, that's that. I, I want to make this claim here. By affecting the comfort level and the performance pressure that we feel in specific situations and in entire walks of life, identity contingencies can affect both specific performances, life-defining choices of careers, relationships, regions of the country to live in, and so on. I want to argue that these identities that grow out of contingencies, that grow out of the way a society is organized around identities, have huge implications for, for us. We tend to think in this society especially that, that as individuals, individu that these things aren't that, much, aren't that important to us or that, that, that they're not important to us unless we let them be that important to us. And I'm trying to stress here the kind of reality that makes identities important to us. The other thing I want to argue, uh, stress in, the, in this part of the talk, is that uh, contingencies that threaten us are particularly gripping. They really do get our attention and they really do galvanize these identities. And this is a, uh, a quote that puts that pretty well. It's from a great book I recommend, In the Name of Identity, by Amin Malouf, on how explaining violence that in defense of an identity, people can be more violent than they, than they often are in defense of themselves. Um, at any rate, people often see themselves in terms of whichever one of their allegiances or identities is under attack. Whether he accepts or conceals it, proclaims it discreetly or flaunts it, it is with that allegiance, that identity that the, that the person identifies. So when one feels under some threat, just imagine a situation, you're the only man in the room, you're the only woman in the room, uh, you're the only old guy in the room. I've recently had more of those experiences than I'd like. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you feel 
that uh, identity. What will it mean? How will I be seen? How, wh how will people respond to my work? I, on and on. That those, the, 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 the sense that you could be under threat based on an identity pushes this identity in and makes it especially uh, uh, powerful for us. Okay, uh, I think that's really all the theory I want to bring up at this point. This is just a summary that says social identities originate from and are sustained by contingencies that go with them in particular situations. That's the, the that's claim. And uh, the second claim is that the most psychologically impactful contingencies are those that threaten us. Those are the two operating assumptions that I'm making. Now I want to move into the research, the experiments that, that uh, capture the test experiment uh, a stereotype threat because stereotype threat is a perfect example of an identity contingency. It's a very subtle identity contingency and so one that might not be might be tempted to think it's not very powerful but you'll see I think that it, it can be quite uh, powerful. Uh, what it is is simply being in a situation uh, or doing something for which a negative stereotype about one of your identities applies to you or could be applied to you. That's all it takes. Just being in a situation for which a negative stereotype about one of your identities could be applied to you in that situation. At that moment, at some level, often implicit, you have a, the realization that you could be judged or treated in terms of that stereotype. And if you care about what you're doing, this is an important uh, point, if you care about what you're doing in that situation, the prospect of being negatively stereotyped like that or reduced to a stereotype can be upsetting and distracting and can interfere with your functioning in that situation. That's just the, that's the basic idea. As you can see, stereotype threat is not something that is a piece of a person's personality. It's a, it's a person, it's a part of the situation. We realize it because we know the culture we, we're in, we know the stereotypes that are in it, and we know we're doing something that's relevant to it, and then we, we know that we could be judged that way or treated that way. That's where the threat ar 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 arises. So our, our idea was if, could this be a factor in this problem I mentioned at the outset of the talk, un, the underperformance uh, on, on cognitive tests and, and, and academic situations. Our very first experiment looked at this uh, as, a, as an account of why women might underperform on a difficult math test. So we did, this is years ago at the University of Michigan, uh, a simple uh, experiment. We got men and women who were really good at math and cared an awful lot about math. They were invested in it as a, as a career uh, path for themselves. They're, they're sophomores in college at this, this point. They had high scores, high grades, and, and the like. We brought them into the laboratory one at a time and gave them a really difficult math test, a half an hour section of the graduate record exam you take if you're a math major. So really, not the quantitative section, but the math section of the, the, uh, of the GRE. Our idea was that for the women, for women, this would be a very different experience than it would be for the men. And this is where you can start to, we argue that women in this situation have different contingencies of identity that make the experience of taking a test like that a very different experience for them. For them, when they start to experience frustration on that test, the stereotype of, in this society, let's call it the Larry Summers stereotype for, for lack of a, just to put a fine point on it, uh, uh, that stereotype uh, rears its head and becomes a plausible explanation of the experience, of the emotion, of the frustration that the person is having in that situation. And remember, these are women who care about doing well in math. So the prospect of, of even in this situation, privately, they're alone in a room taking a test, but the prospect for these women to confirm that kind of stereotype could be upsetting and it might begin to interfere with their performance. That was our idea. For men, these, they're too heavily invested in doing well in math. This is an equally frustrating test for them. They, they could find out that they themselves as individuals aren't very good at math, but they're not at risk of confirming anything as like a group-based limitation of ability. That's not on the line for them. And one thing I'd say as an aside, I think it's, that we've learned in this research, it's often much more upsetting to think that something that you're being limited in life because of, your, of a group identity than it is to think that you're being limited in life because of your own limitations. That's, that's a little bit more acceptable than thinking that it's something about your group. So oh, our, our, our prediction was, 
women in this situation would not do as well as the men, even though they are equally selected them carefully for being equally qualified. And let's see, this is what happens. It's a very dramatic difference there. The bar on your left, the dark bar, is, is women's performance on this half hour section of the test, and the tall white bar is men's performance on this section uh, of, the, of the test. So what we had expected happened. However, there is uh, a Larry Summers interpretation to this particular pattern of data, which is that, well, there really are biological differences between men and women in math performance that manifest themselves when a test is very difficult, and that's what you're picking up here. You're not picking up any repression of women's math performance by stereotype threat. You're just picking up what some of us may have suspected all along. So to separate the two explanations, uh, you needed a condition where you could basically do this experiment over again, but uh, this time give an instruction that would lift stereotype threat out of the situation, that would make women not experience stereotype threat in this situation. And the way we did that after a lot of, I mean, it really took about a, a, a year or so to come up with a, a decent way of doing this, it turned out to be very simple. We just said to them uh, before they took the test, uh, you may have heard that women don't do as well as men on difficult standardized math tests, but that's not true for this particular test. On this particular test, Women always do as well as men is, you know, just, just you could, you, you, nothing about the implicit messages, nothing about your performance here could confirm anything about your being a woman. So when you do that and you do the experiment over again, you get that. The women's performance comes up dramatically. If I've got this thing pointed correctly. And, you know, if, as I often say, if it wasn't for that effect, I probably wouldn't be standing here now. <laughs> It, it, was, it was these data, and I, I can't carry these around in my, peri, in my uh, th these are ancient data, many much more contemporary demonstrations of this, but it's almost like a superstition. I carry these around because they were the, the ones that first made it clear that, well, something like this could be a factor in something that we typically see as, as almost unmodifiable. You think of cognitive abilities as something, you sit somebody down in front of a test and you're pretty much going to get at the heart of their of their cognitive abilities, and this is arguing that, well, uh, there are contingencies of identity that can make, in certain circumstances, very dramatic differences in how they perform in that situation. Soon we did research on race, um, and the experiment I'm going to describe next is, is, is an example of it. It's not, it's not one that we did. It's better than the ones we did, so I use it rather than the ones we actually did. Uh, I like, it's better because it used a real IQ test. It used the uh, Raven's Progressive Matrices IQ test, which is a test where you're given, you, you, each item is a square with a pattern on it, a big square with a pattern on it, and then there are five little squares, and you have to pick the little square that continues the pattern on the big square. And they start out really easy, and you think, this is cool, but then they get really, really, really hard. And, and nobody, almost nobody, can, can really get through uh, all of them. So they just get increasingly more frustrating. Remember, frustration is the ingredient that makes the stereotype about your group relevant as an interpretation of your experience in this situation. So for black students, we made the same reasoning, that as they took this test and went along and experienced frustration, uh, they would, the stereotype would become relevant to them at some point. It would distract them. They'd worry that they're confirming the stereotype or that there's something true about it or whatever. All that going on would undermine their performance on the test and they wouldn't do as well. But if you could give them the same test with an instruction that made the stereotype irrelevant as an interpretation of their performance, they would do just fine on the test. It was a kind of a, it felt like a bold prediction at the time, given the broad assumptions there are about race and ability and implicit assumptions in this society. But that was the prediction. So we gave them this, this Brown and Day, the two researchers, gave these tests to white students at Oklahoma and black students at Oklahoma. And in two of the conditions, they, they understood the test to be a test of intelligence. One condition actually made that explicit. Another condition allowed them to assume it. But in the critical condition where, we, where they relieved the stereotype threat, they told them that this was not a test of intelligence. It was just a puzzle, just a puzzle. Had no diagnostic, no ability to diagnose intelligence. 
The two right hands for your, on your side uh, bars are the bars where the test is given pretty much under ordinary circumstances, and you see quite a dramatic underperformance by black students on, the, on this uh, IQ test. It's a full standard deviation, which just turns out to be the exact size of the difference between black and white IQ in the larger population, a full standard deviation. I would never argue that, that stereotype threat alone explains that entire gap, so don't get me wrong here, but in this experiment, it did. The whole gap, whoops, did I just have my hand on that thing and it moved? <laughs> okay. Um, oh, God, this is going in the wrong direction. There we go. Um, when the test was seen as a puzzle, though, their IQ scores are identical to those of whites. Same test, just represented as a puzzle. Black scores here, white scores here, everybody about the, about the same under those circumstances. Another piece of data that gives you some sense of the power of this kind of contingency of identity. I can go on. There are all kinds of experiments. You can make, you can make white males underperform, you know, graduate student engineers at Stanford, you can make them underperform by just before, by telling them just before they take a difficult math test that Asians tend to do better at math than whites. Tell them that, then they get in that test, the frustration starts to happen, they feel themselves confirming uh, not a negative, st a standing negative stereotype about their own group, but but they're in the negative light of another group's positive stereotype, and they're confirming that. And since they're very invested in, ma in math, that's upsetting, and they un underperform. Um, I wanted to just mention another st uh, study here, that uh, experiment, uh, uh, a stereotype choice study, that's a little bit off the, the, the narrative, but, but kind of not. It relates to that second problem uh, uh, I, I talked about, the diversity problem. Of, of how to make environments envir environments that where people feel, in a sense, identity safe and function well together. Um, here we were looking at the kind of stereotype threats that whites may experience much more typically than they experience stereotype threat around intellectual matters. They may experience stereotype threat in interracial interactions. That may be where the situation where they experience stereotype threat, and that this could have a great deal to do with the with the experience of being in integrated settings. Uh, the idea was simple, that when whites are in an inter, inter, interracial conversation about something uh, that may be relevant to race, there's this possibility of being judged or, or, or treated in terms of that negative stereotype about whites as racist or racially insensitive or something of that sort, and that can be a very upsetting prospect that can have effects on behaviors. In fact, it may lead people to avoid having these kinds of interactions, and that may be one of the factors that makes these settings difficult. So we did a very simple experiment. You can guess the results of it as I describe it. We brought white males into the lab one at a time, and, and we told them they were going to be having a conversation with two other students. And in one condition, the two other students, they saw the pictures on the table of the two other students. In one condition, the two other students were two white guys. In another condition, the two other students are two black guys. And they're going to have the conversation, it turns out, either about love and relationships, which apparently college students from pre-testing can talk to each other very easily about, or they're going to have the conversation uh, not about that, but about racial profiling. So they're going to talk to either two black guys or two white guys, and they're going to talk either about love and relationships or racial profiling. The experimenter then says, okay, I'm going to, get up, I'm going to go get your two uh, conversation partners and bring them back. And by the way, while I'm gone, would you arrange the chairs for the conversation over here? And as soon as they arrange the chairs for the conversation, you can, uh, might imagine the experiment's over. That's, that's what we're looking for. How do they space themselves in relation to each other uh, as a function of these different possible conversations they, they could have? And, and the results are something you can probably uh, predict. When they're going to talk to two white guys about anything, love and relationships or racial profiling, they put the three chairs very close together and expect to have a very you know, get it on kind of conversation. When they're going to talk to two black guys about love and relationships, they put the ch three chairs very close to uh, together with each other. But when they're going to talk to two black guys about racial profiling, they put the two black guys down here and themselves <laughs> down here. They put distance between them. 
And uh, this is a kind of dissonant distance that's most typically thought of as reflecting underlying prejudice. But interestingly, what we found was that the, in that critical condition, the least prejudiced people put their chairs the farthest away. The least prejudiced people put their chairs the farthest away because, in a sense, they have the most to lose in this conversation if it should go awry on racial profiling with these two black guys. It would really hurt if they were judged negatively in that situation, and so it's a much more loaded situation for them. For women in math, the stereotype threat has its biggest effect by far on women who care the most about math and are the most dedicated for it. The same with, with, uh, with African-American college students. The ones that are, who care the most are the ones that are affected by the prospect of being judged that way. Caring makes you vulnerable to this uh, identity contingency. That, that's how it works. We also know a great deal about what happens inside the person while they're experiencing stereotype threat. Huge physiological reactions of, of, of all sort. Uh, women in, in, under stereotype threat taking a math test. The prefrontal cortex is suppressed. Activity in the prefrontal cortex is suppressed. Activity in the amygdala, which is much more sent vigilant to cues, threatening cues in a situation is much more activated. You take stereotype threat away and the reverse happens. Activity in the amygdala goes down, activity in the prefrontal cortex goes up, and their performance goes up. Uh, if you ask them, this is not to even mention cardiac reactivity, which is in, very intense under stereotype threat, but the interesting thing is if you ask them about it, do you, did you experience uh, uh, that? No. No. There's very little subjective sense of being under that, that particular uh, stress. There's very little subjective sense of it, even though we can look at the physiological reactions and see uh, a, a great deal to it. Okay, um, that's sort of the basic lay of the land. Um, the next question is, well, what makes this threat really strong and what makes it weak? What, what affects the strength of this? As a psychologist, our reflexes were to say, well, there must be something about the individual, people who have lower self-esteem, who have lower expectations about math, people who, uh, I don't know, just don't think as well of themselves and don't have as much resilience will show this effect the most. But as I've just said, the people that show this effect the most are the people that are the strongest. They have the best set of skills, the strongest expectations, the most dedication, the most motivation. They're not underperforming in these situations because they're giving up. They're underperforming because they're trying too hard. They're just trying too hard. They're racing through these tests. They're changing their, their, their answers. They're fidgeting and just trying to beat something that they have relatively little awareness of. So we couldn't go down the psychological road, which is, I think, the standard way of thinking about these kinds of problems. We had to go and become more sociological <laughs> uh, and look to cues. And I suppose that's the word that uh, uh, is, is the heart of our answer. That the strength, the degree to which a person experiences stereotype threat depends on the cues in a situation that suggest that you might have things to deal with in that situation because you've got that identity. That's how uh, it would work. I'll give you an example. Uh, I should say here that I developed these ideas uh, following one of your own faculty, Val Valerie Purdy Vaughan, who's, who's a, uh, a professor in the psychology department. We, we work long and hard to, <laughs> to sort among the, the various explanations. And because she's given her talk so much on this campus, I'm going to talk about some other data that's relevant to it here. But, but if you want to hear the real, the real dope on this, go hear her talk sometime. <laughs> Uh, this is a study that another graduate student and I, I did, uh, and well, this is just to restate that Q idea. Think of this as the math department at Stanford, because it is the math department at Stanford. Uh, think of yourself as a graduate student in that office, and think of the right next to the men's and women's bathrooms. Uh, there, that's a contingency of identity. You have to go in the right, as a function of your identity, you have to go in the right bathroom. Uh, or you'll be embarrassed or arrested, I don't know what, but it won't be good. Uh, but it's so familiar that uh, it isn't much of a cue that would put you in mind of, of, your, of your identity. Uh, so I would call that more or less a neutral cue. However, and this is the real math department at Stanford, if it looks like that, where 
you are the female graduate student in this office, and you would have to go all the way down the stairs to find the, the women's bathroom in the, in the building. That, that, that cue might make you aware of a whole host of things. <laughs> uh, you can see that the cue itself is completely innocent. Uh, you know, you, you could never police it with laws. Uh, it's just, and it could be, that bathroom could be put there under the very best of intentions. And everybody in the building could be pulling for women to do very well in math. But that cue suggests who's been here, what the history of this discipline is, who succeeds in this discipline, who doesn't succeed in this. That, that cue all by itself, I, I remember going to a Silicon Valley uh, startup f a, a firm once to pick up a graduate student of mine for lunch. And, and I walked in, and this, I never felt so old in my life. The, the CEO was 26. Uh, everybody else, he was the oldest guy working there. There was music playing that I'd never heard before. Uh, you know, there were bicycles hanging over people's cubicles. It just, there were just so many cues in there that were age, that sent an age signal to me. Uh, all innocent, uh, but nonetheless, they made me very vividly aware of having a particular identity. And that if I had to work in that situation, if I actually had to go to work there, you can imagine those cues, innocent though they are, might begin to really have some effect on my sense of comfort there, my functioning there, and, and the like. So uh, Mary Murphy and I did a very simple experiment, uh, a little devious, but nonetheless very simple. We brought women and, and men, uh, math and engineering majors at Stanford into the laboratory one at a time, and they thought the idea was that they were going to be interviewed for participation, acceptance into a summer workshop on math and engineering at Stanford. That was the premise. And when they arrived, we said, well, you're also participating in an experiment after this. And so to save time, we would like right now just to hook you up to all of this physiological recording equipment that we happen to have here. So uh, we put electrodes on them, and we can measure this and that and so on. So we, we have now uh, a measure of their physiology as they wait for this interview to happen. And while the interview is, is, while they're waiting, we show them videotapes. In one condition, the videotape uh, shows, it shows pictures of the workshop that they're, that they're interviewing for. And in one of the videos, there is a one-to-one -one ratio of men to women. For every woman, there's a man. In the other video, for the other set of subjects, it's a three-to-one ratio, three men for every woman, for every woman. That's all there is to this experiment. That's all there is. Just if, if I don't know if I have these uh, pictures here. Yeah, there they are. Um, I, I like to show them because when you look at them, you got to look twice to see this. It isn't. It is not a a, a, a big cue. It's a, it's a relatively subtle cue. You can see it, but you have to kind of pay attention. Uh, okay, here's what happened in this experiment. These, these are the results, and this is always going to be the critical cell to look at. These are women uh, who saw the three-to-one ratio of, uh, of, of men to women. That's, the, that's what they saw. So these are the women who saw, looked at this workshop and saw relatively few women in it. That was the cue. Well, when that happens, interestingly, they remember more details of both the experimental room and incidental details of the videotape. They remember more of the details. That tells us that what they're doing in that situation is paying attention to the circumstances, to the condition. That cue has made them vigilant to whether or not there are features of this workshop that might be kind of identity, identity issues. And just that ratio makes provokes that, and they start to pay attention to those things, and so they remember them better. Think about being the only man in the room or the only woman in the room. If you're the only man in the room, you start to pay attention. You start to count. How many other men are there? What's, what are they doing? Where are they? Why aren't they here? What's the, why am I here? And why are they, the, 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 that, just, that kind of processing just starts to happen, and this, and this just reflects that. This is just a, another memory uh, measure of the, same, of the same kind of thing. Um, this is cardiovascular reactivity, which I, which I think is amazing to me. But look how much more reactive cardio. This is, a, this is sort of a combination of, uh, of measures of cardiovascular reactivity, pulse, blood pressure, and the like. And look how much more reactive they are than, than the women and than the, than the participants in the other uh, conditions. And it goes along with the sort of psychological experience of feeling like you don't belong in the situation. It corresponds with not belonging in the situation. Okay. 
cues then, and you know, again, if I could give Valerie's talk, she would show you another beautiful set of studies looking at, at, at cues and, and the consequences of them. Uh, Lee, th that's what we think is the source of things. And there's good news in that and bad news. The, the bad news is, this is toward remedy, I'm getting toward the end, uh, identity threat is intrinsic to most diverse settings. It's the default state of affairs unless something else is done. Now, I, I, I want to stress here, you, you can see that this identity threat ar arises out of the way a situation is organized around identity, which arises out of the history of this society, which arises out of the continuing differences that, uh, of experience in this society based on group identity. And the, it arises out of all those things, the very sociological, economic, the big picture. Uh, produces these things, and we're talking about how it's experienced uh, by the in individual. But I'm arguing that for all of those reasons, we carry our history into our day-to-day -day social experience. It's not something you can just wipe off. Our identities mean, mean something, and that is a fundamental feature of, of, of an integrated setting, an integrated society. It has to contend with that reality, is the argument here. And the, the good news, however, is uh, this. Some level of salience of identity safety cues, something that makes a person feel identity safe in a situation, in a setting, can foster trust even when other cues in a setting are, are, are otherwise threatening. When I was in graduate school, I won't go into deta details, but it was so long ago, you can probably imagine there weren't many blacks there. Uh, they weren't well thought of. There was a guy down the hall that would use the N-word on a regular uh, basis. Uh, and people, there, people, common discourse in psychology at the time was the, the, the racial differences in IQ and what that meant and whether they were genetic. And this was just standard fare for, those, for that era. So there were cues all over the place and they did make me feel like I didn't belong and they were, and, and caused a lot of stress reactions of the sort that, that I, we're pulling out in, in this research. I did have a very uh, good relationship with my advisor who seemed to, I think of maybe because he was coming up for tenure and I was his only graduate student and <laughs> he needed me, <laughs> so he kind of believed in me. <laughs> And I could tell he believed in me because, you know, he demanded a lot and he demanded it at all hours like Sunday nights and all kinds of, of time when I thought I should be off. And, and, and we really got into the work. And that seemed to do it. That seemed to tell me that he wasn't seeing me stereotypically. And then when I had that feeling that I had within this relationship somebody who could regard me in this way, I began to relax in the situation. The same cues that otherwise would have been very threatening and daunting and off-putting, and were indeed, were just less so. I'm not claiming that there was any uh, magical, miracle cure here. It took a long time to, to get used to dealing with that, that kind of situation. But, but the, the fact that there was a relationship there that, that, that seemed where I, I wasn't seen that way gave me a sense that, that I didn't have to interpret every cue in the same dire way I had been interpreting them. Okay. Um, that's the general principle. I think I've got it on another slide here. but. Uh, it's just the principle of identity safety, that if, if there's a cue, if you can give some, somebody a sense of being safe in an environment, you don't have to change every cue, take the bicycles off the, their hooks. If you, you might, you know, play more varied music in that situation than what they were playing. But, uh, you, can, you can be responsive, uh, but at the same time, the critical thing the person is looking for, the individual, is a sense of safety there, that, they, that their identity is not going to lead them to have to deal with difficult things because they've got that identity. Ways of doing it, they have begun to, I'm so grateful to point out, proliferate in the literature. And uh, some uh, uh, are, are quite dramatic demonstrations. I'm just going to mention uh, a few. I think leadership is a big deal. I, I've just been more and more impressed with that as I've gotten older. Leaders set the norms for how institutions function. And when leaders put a good deal of, of value on diversity, that changes the norms and the whole sensibility within an institution from the top down, and it makes it a much more identity safe for all, uh, for all of the people in it, and I think you will start to see fewer group differences in performance, that it actually translates into differences in performance. That's the, 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 the hard accountability that this work is holding itself to. Uh, critical mass, as I've just tried to illustrate, is a big deal. Um, 
Here's, some, here's a clever one. How does a white professor give a black student critical feedback uh, and have that feedback be trusted? Simple experiment. We had white and black Stanford students write essays about their favorite teacher, and we told them we were going to evaluate these essays uh, and give them feedback on, on the uh, uh, essay. Um, and we did that. They had to come back two days later and get the feedback. And we, what we were interested in is whether they believed the feedback, whether they were motivated to improve their essays and the like. Those, those were the kinds of things we were interested in. And what we varied was how do you give the feedback? Well, how does, how does, how does a white guy give feedback in that situation? Well, the two things that didn't work were very interesting. Just giving the feedback directly did not work. The black students did not trust that feedback. And you can see when you think about it why. Uh, it's ambiguous. Is the feedback coming from the stereotype or is it coming from my work? I don't know. I just really don't know. I'd have to really trust this guy, and why would I trust this guy uh, to, to believe that? Uh, and so not knowing, feeling kind of ambiguous, they don't respond as well to the, to the feedback. They aren't as motivated to improve their essays. It doesn't help one bit if the evaluator does what most of us do, which is to add, before we give the negative feedback, a sort of positive bromide about the person. You know, something like, well, I really think the world of, of your brother, and uh, I, uh, <laughs> I've, I've known your, your family for, and you seem like such a warm and wonderful guy. Here's the feedback. That really is not trusted. Black students trust it less and are less motivated to improve their essays when they get feedback that way. But when the feedback, there is a way that works. And it's, it's pretty much like the experience of, of my graduate school days. That's why I brought that, that story up. It illustrates it. If you give the feedback, uh, you say, look, uh, here's some, some critical feedback, uh, but I've read your essay, and I think that you can, can write a great essay. Just You can do really well. I really believe you've got the ability to do well here. This could be a great essay if you work on this essay. That kind of feedback is just transformative for black students. Seventy-five percent of them in that student, in that condition, that group, took the essay home to improve. And this was not a course for credit. This was just an experiment. The most that did that in any other cell of the, of the experiment was like 30, 35 uh, percent. It's, it's very powerful feedback for any of us. I've looked at your work and I think you can do this. It can change your life. It can, it can direct your life in a certain direction. It's rare feedback. Uh, to get, but it's especially uh, powerful. And when, though, when, and it, for 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 minority students, it disambiguates the feedback and has a powerful effect. It tells them they're not being seen in terms of that stereotype that's sitting there all the time as the alternative explanation for what's going on in the situation. Another experiment. Um, students are given a narrative. They're coming into college. This happens to have been done at Yale, which I'm realizing is a rival of ours. Um, <laughs> um, black and white students, they, they see the results of a survey of senior students. And uh, the survey tells them that, look, uh, when I came to Yale, this is a survey of, of minority students. And the survey says, when I came to Yale, I felt really alienated. I, didn't, I felt like I didn't belong. Uh, all this Gothic architecture. Uh, I felt like I had to go home in the weekend, how, on the weekends. How could I ever fit into this kind of a culture that's just so unconnected to the culture I've got and so on, but actually uh, I went home and, you know, my father got sick of me coming home on the weekends and said, look, go back and make some friends and make the best of it. This is a big opportunity. And so I did that and I made a friend and we started a singing group and then I, uh, we went to the sociology department and I heard a fantastic lecture and then I went to the biology department and I heard another fantastic lecture and I, I don't know what I'm going to do, biology or sociology, but I just feel like all the, that, that Yale has got all this stuff to offer me. It's this, mu this incredible, rich, uh, so you, you see the, the, the narrative. It's, it's, it, the, the narrative acknowledges the, the, the stress that the minority student might be feeling, the, the tension that they might be feeling, makes it seem normal, and at the same time projects a, a, a very positive outcome at, at the same time. Well, students who saw that, that just took a half an hour. Their grades were better, two-thirds of a letter grade better in the next semester, and the same uh, for two years subsequent to that. A, a, a recursive process starts to happen where you start to feel, this is research that Valerie is also very close to in another setting, 
Uh, Jeff Cohen is, I think, the, the, on this particular study, Jeff Cohen and Greg Walton are the primary guys. But their argument is that a recursive process happens. I start to relax a little bit. The cues aren't so menacing to me as a result of hearing this narrative about what college can be like. And then I, re I start to do a little better. And I start to do a little better, and the cues in the situation are, uh, again, less, th less, further less threatening to me. And then I start to do a little better. And uh, you get this kind of recursive process that over time actually builds confidence and, and security in this, in this situation, and, and, and performance goes, goes up, up in it. Uh, the same thing, and this is a study that, that, that Valerie is, is uh, running as we speak in, in New Haven. Same thing at the, at the uh, uh, junior high school level where the effects last for two years from a, from a, a brief intervention like that, which, and, and when I, the, the only reason that I might be tempted, that I, I was initially, I initially had doubts. Could this possibly be true? <laughs> uh, so an intervention that short have that kind of an effect. But now it's been replicated at the college level, it's been replicated t at, in New Haven, it's been replicated in Boulder, Colorado, it's been replicated in a number of circumstances. And th this, the, the, the whole notion hinges on this kind of recursive process. And the data, uh, I wish I had the time to show you, sort of reflect it where they gr the, the students gradually march up and the racial gap in performance gradually reduces over a period of time. So you, you get the image of a person who's gradually feeling more and more comfortable in, in in this situation. Uh, well, uh, I could go on by changes of list of things by ch that, that, that kind of, I think, speak to the importance of this set of processes, these identity contingencies, uh, and in particular, this, the, the particular identity contingency of stereotype threat, although uh, there are others that are just being marginalized. I used to live in Salt Lake City. It wasn't race that made me, or any stereotypes about being black that were the issue. I was not Mormon. And if in that situation, you, you don't know what they think of you. You just know you're not at the center of that, of, of that, of that world. So just marginalization alone can be another form of threat that can begin to have these, these kinds of effects. But um, I just want to end by summarizing a few, a, a few uh, uh, principles here. By changing the way you give critical feedback, you can dramatically improve minority students' motivation, receptiveness, and performance. And, uh, uh, always I'm talking about cognitive performance, achievement in school. Those are the hard-nosed outcomes I'm talking about. By improving groups' critical mass in a setting, you can improve their trust, comfort, performance. I wish we'd had these data when, when we were at the Supreme Court because I think we could make a much more persuasive case about the value of critical mass to intellectual uh, development and, 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 and progress in, in an institution. Uh, by simply fostering intergroup conversations among students from different backgrounds. I didn't give you that experiment, but oftentimes just the ability to talk to each other, you reveal that your experiences are not happening to you just because you're a member of a particular group, and when they, they it kind of leads you to, to interpret your experience less in terms of, of, of that group identity, and you begin to relax in the situation, and you're able to engage it more, more uh, easily. By allowing students, especially minority students, to affirm their most valued sense of, of self, sometimes just the opportunity to affirm a sense of, of your worth in a situation means that the cues that are threatening you in this situation are, just aren't as important to you. They just, they're there, but they just aren't as important to you in this sense of being reminded of, of, of your value in, in the situation. Well, I can go on, but I think maybe I should stop at this point and allow people to have some questions. So thank you very much. So we'll have uh, questions, both microphones, and please make the uh, questions brief. Uh, I just want to say I think we're launching a provost uh, that you better be careful around because he's going to understand you better than you understand yourself, and that's a dangerous thing. Do so we have any questions? Yeah. You bet, Michelle. Provost Steele, what do you say about those situations in which the threatening cues are actually reinforced sometimes by the group with the identity in question? So 
women who will raise their daughters telling them that don't worry about your grade in math because women aren't any good at math anyway. Or in um, black communities sometimes, particularly in elementary schools at the early years, where sometimes there is a, an idea afoot that somehow academic success is uh, acting white. So I just throw that out there. How do you, what, what are some of the remedies for uh, the situation that results when it's coming from the group itself, the, the, the acceptance of the threatening cue? Yeah, I think you raise a, an important point because that, when it's coming from the group itself, it can be more um, insidious and, and difficult to, to recognize for what it is. Uh, and, and maybe be more more threatening there. So uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I uh, other than to try to make people aware of how costly those kind of remarks can be, how, how much impact that, that they can have. They, they really are reinforcing the stereotype and and making it much more powerful in the lives of uh, of kids. Uh, the the acting white data. Uh, is something that, interestingly, I'm, I'm thinking of, of research by uh, Roland Pryor, which, uh, um, if I've got his, I'm, I somehow I'm not confident I'm pronouncing his last name correct. Roland Fryer, I think, um, which which uh, documents that mo it says that's strongest in integrated schools. It's not so strong in more uh, segregated schools, and, and usually I do get a question about that. Well. Uh, are these stereotype pressures stronger in uh, integrated settings than they than they are in in group homogeneous uh, settings, segregated uh, settings? And I think I think I have to admit that they are uh, stronger that way. That it's, it's the it's it's the bringing of these identities together that creates the the contingencies that that uh, that I'm talking about. Uh, how, however, I don't want to <laughs> be seen as advocating that as the as as the remedy. Um, and I, I would take uh, I would take all of this the research, the thrust of this research, as as an attempt to to try to understand uh, how you can make a, a setting work for a, an integrated setting work effectively for for everybody. And I think we're we're making a, a progress on that. Um, you know, would I argue that a sophomore math class in, in a high school should should never be uh, gender segregated? I, I'm not sure I'd go that far. I'm not sure I'd be absolutistic about it. There may be circumstances, but I don't think that kind of th that segregation is the general answer to things. I answered two questions there. <laughs> yeah. I was just wondering if if you could explain why in some of the experiments where they were gender or color neutral in the way in which the situation was presented, the, the women's performance and the black performance went up, but the male performance and the white performance appeared to go down. Yeah. Um, that has gotten to be a well-known phenomenon called stereotype lift. <laughs> uh, and the idea is that it's, it's slightly advantageous to be on the upside of somebody else's negative stereotype. Uh, and I can imagine how it works. I'm not sure that exactly how it works has been worked out in research yet, but um, uh, if I'm in the group, well, I, I do use the example of being African American and being a very lousy basketball player, uh, but having that lousiness be something that hardly ever discouraged me from, uh, from playing. And, and uh, um, uh, I can make tons of mistakes in, the, in, in that setting and not really read it as me being inappropriate to the setting, because that's the setting where my group does, does well. well. This is our setting. This is, you know, this is us. Uh, so frustration uh, doesn't mean uh, the, the, the same uh, thing, you know, depending on how the, the stereotypes are, uh, about your group. It, you know, one, one, I remember one very poignant experience was going, giving a test once in a, in a junior high school and a, a difficult math test, and all the students knew that they didn't do well. And you talk to the boys after the math test, and the boys would say, uh, "That was the stupidest test I have ever seen. That you know, our teacher never covered any of that stuff, and you know, and our teacher's not that good anyway." <laughs> there, there was no internalization of the. the you, you, the, the girls on the other hand would say, "You know, geez, you know, maybe, maybe I'm just not so good at math." That, and that's, that's sort of an example of how just the, the overall stereotype structure of our society affects a, a, the personal interp 
interpretation of experience and the nature of a person's experience in the domain, that those stereotypes just implicitly, without us having very much aware of it, make certain interpretations of our emotions sensible and other interpretations of our emotion less sensible, depending on our identity. And then you start to see the cumulative effects of that over the course of a, of a lifetime, and you, you get a better insight into how these group differences start to start to emerge. Some groups lifted, some groups repressed, just because of the nature of the stereotype structure of a, of a society. Darcy. So I could see how one might argue not to uh, have children in a segregated or an only sex circumstance, but there is also the argument of armoring somebody against the future life in which you'll be in a very mixed environment. And I wonder if there's any data that would suggest that uh, sort of critical period phenomenon, for example, girls in an all-girls school where only individual differences make any difference, whether you could show that there was an effect in later life of not perceiving that stereotype threat because it had never been operative beforehand. Uh, yes. I, I mean, I, I think I have to point to data. Ma many of the women who, American women who wind up in math and quantitatively based fields have gone to uh, women's colleges, women's schools. Uh, for African Americans, uh, historically black colleges and universities educate about 17 percent of the African American college population these days, but they graduate about 60 percent of all those who go into again, math and quantitatively, scientifically based, uh, based fields. So uh, uh, again, I, I, you, have, you have to start with that, with, with that uh, fact, but I don't, uh, it's very important to accept, I think, that segregation is not uh, the answer. Uh, and as you point out, uh, there is some evidence that going to succeeding in an integrated situation does armor one, does enable one to, to persist longer in, in subsequent, in, in later levels of schooling and in, and in one's professional life. Yes. Um, Professor Steele, my question is a little bit uh, politically inclined, so it might not be in the academic psychological research that you uh, were speaking of, so please excuse me if it's um, <laughs> wrongly directed. So my question is, um, I see in society that there are a lot of political um, stereotypes about Muslim women and you know subservient women who cannot speak for themselves, who are not as educated, and then you have government you know, trying to reinforce, uh, in my opinion, quite negatively by rectifying the situation themselves and deciding for them what they can or cannot wear, like in France. So I feel pretty strongly about it, and I wanted to know like, if there was any research done on that, like what kind of effect is it having on Muslim women who are perceived to be weak, and um, you know, there are soci you know, societal forces deciding for them because they cannot speak for themselves. Yeah, I, you know, I can't answer that question with any, any, anything other than newspaper knowledge about the this, this specific situation that you're, you're talking about. Uh, so all I, all I could do is sort of a fall back on general principle. Uh, and it, it's, what, what can I say, it's not a good experience to be negatively stereotyped in, in those ways, and it's going to cause a lot of the kind of effects that you that, that you see documented in, in, in this research. It may not always be in a cognitive domain. This research is focused on stereotypes about cognitive functioning, and we've measured its effects on those kinds of behaviors. But, if, but other stereotypes have other allegations inherent in them, and uh, that's where you would look to see the consequences of that kind of, uh, of, of negative, negative stereotyping. I'm sure that doesn't begin to answer the, 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 the question you, you have, but that would take a lot longer discussion to, to do that. Uh, good evening. Nick, Nick Christie, Blick from Earth and Environmental Sciences. Um, this is a technical question. Uh, I was interested in the, the results, and they're very intriguing. I've not read the original papers. Um, I noticed that the, the last set of histograms you showed had, had error bars, I presume standard errors in them, it was interesting that the first, all the initial data you showed had histograms with non-zero origins and where there were no error bars shown at all. So it was a little bit hard without knowing the papers to assess just how significant the differences were between the various groups. Hmm. 
Well, most meta-analyses, I would say that, that the average stereotype threat effect is about 0.6 .6 of a standard deviation. This would be over um, 1,500 studies. Uh, it, it's become a huge, uh, it was a cottage industry for a long time and still is. So um, uh, I apologize for those features of those, those histograms. Uh, but the, that, that's what I think you can sort of take to the bank as the, si as the general size of that, of that effect. Again, uh, the effect can be made stronger, a, a, a lot stronger, if you're in a situation where, there are, where the cues start to mount up. And it can be made a lot weaker if you're in a situation where the cues that, that signal stereotype threat as a contingency are, are reduced in a, in a situation. Uh, but overall, the studies that have been done, if we just use that as an indicator, that's about the size of the effects. We have um, two more people standing for questions. Let's take both of those questions, and then we'll conclude there's a reception following in the faculty room. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Hi, Professor Steele. I have a question about, I guess, the way identity is perceived. In these studies, we look at kind of discrete act aspects of identity intelligence, and in the athletic studies they've done, you know, looking at athletics discreetly. I wonder if those discrete aspects are, st are kind of amalgamate into one. For instance, if you ask a black student about athletic ability, does that then have a ramification in terms of tests of intelligence? In other words, do they see their identity as a complete construct of their athletic ability, or their intelligence, their emotional um, kind of capabilities, or do they kind of look at it discreetly? Is that what the data show? Yeah, I, I think the, the right way to interpret that is that it depends on which, which stereotype and which identity are, are the most salient to the person. Uh, I can give you an example in terms of a, a study on athletics. This is, these are elite athletes at the University of Arizona. You know that study. And they're uh, about to perform a golf task. And in one condition, they're told, these are white and black athletes, they're told this is a task of natural athletic ability do the best you can. Under that stereotype, uh, the white athletes go in and underperform in relation to the black athletes. The, we all know that kind of stereotype in, in this uh, society. So uh, black athletes sail through, white athletes flub along. You, do this, you have them take the same ta task, but this time you say, um, this is a t just before they take it, you say, this is a test of sports strategic intelligence. Now, when you do that, it reverses. Now, the white athletes do very well on that task, and the black athletes don't do nearly as well. But very dramatic and sizable uh, differences in performance. So I, I, I think that, that, at least the way I, I keep these things straight in my mind, is, is to think about what, what is salient. You give Asian women a difficult math test, and for, for some of them, just before they take it, you remind them of their gender. Then they do worse than men. Others, you remind them just before they take it of their ethnicity. Then they do the same or slightly better than, than men. So a, a lot of it, and th this is one of the optimistic features of, the, of, these, of this set of findings, is that, is that you can affect the impact of this by what you make salient in a performance situation. And you can even coach people to, to make one thing or another thing salient in a, situ in a situation. And the last question. Okay, so I realize I'm the one keeping everybody from cashing in on their green bracelets. So I'll keep it short. Um, it seems as though it would be very politically incorrect to exploit these identities, and yet it seems to be the secret weapon of advertising. Um, I'm in nutrition, nutrition education, and I, would, I can see how there's an exploitation of someone's expectation that they aren't going to be skilled at doing anything, so they might as well buy ready-to-eat food. Or the excessive consumption by teenagers on, you know, garments that don't need as much of a markup. And it, so, pardon me, I guess I'm kind of asking, it, has this actually become sort of a, as I say, a secret weapon, sort of a hidden way of, of influencing people to do more uh, consumerism? Hmm. That's interesting. Um, I don't know. Uh, I would say I, my first answer would be yes, but I wouldn't take any credit for that. That is, I think in pe people intuitively, especially when you're designing ads in, in, in the marketing world, that, that people intuitively may know that, that raising certain ideas about identity will likely 
shift people's attention or their interests or their preferences in, in certain directions, that, that there's just a lot of intuitive use of something like, uh, uh, like this. But I, you know, I don't know of anybody kind of reading this stuff and then, and then going out and, and explicitly uh, trying to do that, but maybe, maybe it's, it is happening and I just don't know about it. So I don't know. So Claude, <clears throat> thank you for letting us welcome you to Columbia. Thank you. By insisting thank you. that you give us a call.